famous today. So much more famous today. The meeting is being recorded. Uh, I, You're I good just, to go. You're good to go, Tim. <laughs> okay. Probably the reason is my publisher is much smarter than I am and uh, decided that uh, since the test itself was so famous and played such a key role in the uh, the greatest, uh, the most crucial, significant uh, Supreme Court decision of the 20th century, Brown versus the Board of Education, they focused on the doll test on the cover. But the book is not just about the doll test. It's the life story of our two heroes pictured here, Kenneth and Mamie Clark. And so what I thought I would do is uh, show you pictures of them and their people and some pictures of them and their, um, native, their native communities where they were from. So uh, here's uh, Kenneth and Mamie. And the interesting thing about them at this point is that uh, they have already achieved at this young age uh, many of the, of the things for which they're most famous today. And they were on the cusp at the time this picture was taken. I'm not sure if this was in the late 40s or the early 50s, but uh, in either case, they were on the cusp of achieving, uh, uh, taking, uh, accepting a, an important role in Brown versus the Board of Education. But by the time, uh, when this was shot, they had already done the famous doll test, which we're gonna talk a lot about. Um, and it was just briefly um, a test where they approached uh, little black children, very young, ages two to eight, and showed them four dolls, two white, two brown, and asked them which uh, they preferred. Uh, which one did they prefer playing with? Uh, which was the nice one? Which was the bad one? Uh, and questions like that. And ultimately, the last question always was, which one looks like you? Uh, the sad fact is that two-thirds of the children they tested rejected the black doll in favor of the white doll. And, and they tended to... Uh, to label the um, brown doll as bad and the white doll as the nice one. And uh, very sad, some of the children wept and left the room um, uh, frustrated by this, this um, stressful exercise. Uh, most though enjoyed it as a kind of game. And, um, but some of them denied that they were black when they were questioned about which which one looks like you? And, and Kenneth would say, well, aren't you, aren't you uh, colored? Was it a term back then in 1940 when the test was given? Aren't you colored? And they would say, no, no. Are you black? No, no, I'm not black, I'm white. They would actually, some of the children actually said I'm white. And some of the children had derogatory things to say about black people and about black dolls. So um, uh, that's not the whole story um, here that I wanted to talk about with these two. Uh, not that they were more than the doll test. Uh, uh, they both got doctorates at this point in their lives. They both finished uh, Kenneth for 10 years about uh, uh, with a PhD in psychology from Columbia uh, Elite Ivy League school. And maybe too. Um, they were both the first and then the second, she was the second uh, black uh, students to have a PhD in psychology from that university. Uh, they met at Howard University, they married uh, against the wishes of her parents and my dad, who had some reservations about Kenneth. Uh, I think partly because he was a working class background. Uh, uh, but also, I, you should know that Kenneth became the Henry, Dr. Henry Louis Gates of our day. He became the most renowned black uh, public intellectual, the one that most people in America would know about, uh, including white people. Uh, he uh, founded uh, a federal 
uh, war on poverty program called HARU, Harlem Youth Opportunities, uh, and maybe helped found Head Start. Uh, she was on a team of just 12 professionals who cobbled together all the guidelines uh, for the operation of the Head Start centers. Uh, Sergeant Schreiber once said, and he was the head of the War on Poverty, which under which the Head Start was begun, he once said that that group of 12 people did all the work. Uh, that was maybe an overstatement. Well, it was an overstatement, but they were the ones who decided the contours of Head Start, which we have today. Uh, Mamie also built a huge, and I do mean huge, housing and office complex at the corner of Fifth Avenue in New York City and uh, 110th Street in Harlem, across the street from Central Park. And it was a it was a kind it was a housing and office complex that was to be integrated. The Clarks were integrationists. Uh, and she had hoped to bring into Harlem a wave of uh, redevelopment that would enliven and rejuvenate and integrate Harlem. So these are some of the things for which uh, they were the most famous. Uh, Kenneth, incidentally, was a best-selling uh, best writer in his great uh, book, Translating the Many Foreign Languages, in the 60s was Latin Dark Ghetto. Um, okay, so why don't we go on to the next uh, picture. Tim, can you do that for us? Right. The story moves appropriately now for this audience to Arkansas. And we have here uh, Dr. Harold H. Phipps and his wife, Katie, Katie Smith Fitz. And they're standing in front of their Hot Springs home, uh, 302 Garden Street, in a black neighborhood, a segregated black neighborhood. Um, Dr. Phipps came to Hot Springs and hung his shingle in 1908, very early in, uh, in the 20th century, right after the turn of the 20th century. And uh, he came from uh, Meharry Medical College in Nashville. And he arrives at a time when uh, the medical uh, industry was very, very lightly regulated, shall we say. And an awful lot of patent medicine shops lined the street is Central Avenue, which was the main business street in downtown Hot Springs, and it still is. Uh, he even opened a drugstore himself and operated that for a time and closed it. But uh, he uh, had a practice, his medical practice, in an office in the Pythian Hotel, uh, a black hotel in uh, Hot Springs on Malvern Avenue. It's no longer there now, but it was a very big uh, hotel. Uh, and its top floor was. Uh, filled with meta, uh, hosp uh, oh, hospital wards, uh, ward rooms uh, for treating patients. Uh, the uh, Blacks were not allowed to use the city's hospitals. So there were two big elite Black hotels in town, the Pythian Hotel and the Woodman of Union Hotel. And, uh, and both served as a sort of uh, Jerry built a uh, hospital as well as bringing in ailing and, uh, uh, black tourists and, and uh, ailing patients from all over the country, in some cases all over the world. And the uh, Phipps house here, which you see, it's a pretty good sized house with about six or seven bedrooms. And they handled the uh, overflow when the Pythian was full. And uh, so they, their house operated as a kind of uh, elite bed and breakfast because the most renowned of their black guests would, would often stay with them if it was too crowded at the hotel. And so they, they had uh, very close relationships with uh, rather uh, 
distinguished black uh, couples all over the country who would stay in their home. So these were, uh, these two people were uh, part of the uh, African-American elite. Uh, they were aristocrats of color. Uh, Katie helped run both the hotel and this house. And uh, Dr. Phipps was the manager of the hotel. Plus he served patients in his office. And I imagine he probably went out in the hospital wards too of the Pitching Hotel and serve them there. Okay, um, shall we go to the next picture? So this is uh, Doc Phipps before he became a doctor. He's a young man here with his mother uh, on the island of St. Kitts uh, where he was born. Uh, she was uh, a humble woman, she was illiterate. He managed somehow to get to college in Jamaica, Nika College. He became a uh, teacher and then a, a school principal. And I guess it wasn't exciting enough or lucrative enough. And he decided, <coughs> <coughs> pardon me. Well, I have asthma and that's one of my great afflictions. Anyway, uh, he emigrated to uh, the United States, uh, went to school at Meharry uh, Medical College, and got his degree and then went to Hot Springs. Like a number of members of his class, they went to Hot Springs to, to operate. And Hot Springs, you would think a, a small city the size of that city, maybe 20,000 or so, maybe 3,000 Black residents back then, uh, you would think maybe they would only have one doctor uh, so many towns in the, United, in, the United, in the United States. But because it was a health spa, because of the baths, the bathhouses, uh, because of the belief that the waters, the geothermal waters from the hot springs in town uh, rejuvenated one's health, cured illnesses, uh, some even as, as uh, trying as syphilis, uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, that medicine became a uh, very important part of that town's uh, means of economic development. And there were, there were probably at least a half dozen or more black doctors who helped serve these, in many cases, affluent but afflicted uh, black patients. Uh, okay, when do we go? Oh, I should add that Kenneth's, both these families, the Clark and the Phipps family, both had their, had roots in the Caribbean uh, and, and the cultural enrichment that went with that. The emphasis on education, which is so uh, common among uh, West Indians, uh, the people of the, the Caribbean. Uh, uh, West Indians in America used to be derogat uh, in, a, in a derogatory manner referred to as black Jews. They were uh, very assertive. They were very interested in education and they were extremely innovative, uh, 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 let's, let's entrepreneurial. Um, okay, so why don't we go to our next picture here. Okay. Very good. Okay, this is the other side of Mamie's family. Mamie uh, Phipps, uh, Hot Springs, later to marry Kenneth Clark. Uh, this is her grandmother and grandfather surrounded by their children. Uh, however, that, that little boy with the belt that seems to be a kind of loose, uh, he was someone they took into the family. He was not a child of theirs. But this was very common back then in Black families, and it is today, too. Uh, you see a needy child, you bring him into your, your home, provide him with a bed and, a, uh, and meals. Uh, the man that you see there with the handlebar mustache, that's Jesse Rufus Smith. And he and his wife, uh, Mamie Smith, both worked in the bathhouses on Central Avenue. 
Now, Central Avenue, even today, you go down there and you'll see on one side of the street are these uh, bat houses that look like mansions. And on the other side of the street are the businesses. Well, back then, on one side of the street, you would find casinos, you would find all kinds of bars, uh, you would find a lot of panacea shops where you'd get patent medicine, you know, uh, phony medicine. Um, and uh, Jesse, I have to tell you, uh, he worked in um, the Arlington Hotel because the hotels also have had bathhouses. Uh, and he, he, he worked at the Arlington and I believe Mamie did as well. And, uh, but eventually they moved up and they ran the Crystal Hotel, which early in the 20th century served black patients because after all, this is the era of segregation. Uh, now remember that uh, the hospitals rejected black patients uh, in hot springs, you could not if you're black get into a hospital, city hospital. So that's why the hotels were uh, served that that healthful function, uh, and also the bathhouses to some extent they did as well. Uh, they would have foot doctors, chiropodists. Is that the term you use uh, in uh, Tim in Arkansas today? Even is that a term you use? I th yeah, it is. Yeah. In the East here, we use podiatrists. Um, but they were, they, they actually practiced there too. Um, okay, Jesse had been enslaved in Virginia, went north to New York, married, then migrated south to Philadelphia. Uh, his wife died, and not long after that, um, he moved to Arkansas and met this beautiful uh, woman, college edu educated graceful, refined, elegant woman, uh, Mamie uh, Johnson. And so they became a couple, Mary and it became Mamie Smith. And remember, our, our, the hero of our book is uh, Mamie Clark, and she is the namesake of her grandmother, Mamie Smith. On the left there, that young man with the, the boy, I should say, uh, with the blonde hair, he is black, and he has uh, blonde curly hair, and he became rather renowned, uh, uh, really a famous uh, Hot Springs uh, citizen in his day. He uh, was a member, one of the core members of FDR's Black Cabinet, uh, along with Mary McLeod Bethune, for instance, who was the head of the Black Cabinet. Uh, FDR's Black Cabinet. Uh, and he also was a journalist, a renowned journalist. He wrote for uh, a syndicated column that appeared in most uh, fine Black newspapers, but it was, uh, home base was the Chicago Defender, uh, the finest of all the Black newspapers of the 20th century. And, uh, and he wrote a column under the name Charlie Cherokee. Why Cherokee? Well, according to family lore, his mom was part of Cherokee. And uh, she went to Fisk in, in Nashville for a time. And then she graduated from Roger Williams College, a black college there then, but today it's in New Hampshire. Uh, Katie, Katie Smith is that pretty young woman uh, on the left in the back. Uh, at the right shoulder of her dad. And uh, that's Mamie Clark, Mamie Phipps Clark's mother. And the young, uh, the young man uh, to the right, uh, to the left of his father with the suspenders, that's Henry. Now, Henry never became famous. Uh, Henry was a ne'er-do-well and he never did get with the education program, hard work program of his parents who had set very, very high standards for the kids. Um, and Henry uh, took off one day with the family's grocery money, eventually came back and uh, lived with his sister, uh, uh, Katie Phipps, uh, Katie Smith, which you see there, well, she's Katie Phipps then. 
and they she takes him in so he has a place to to sleep and uh and uh food in his stomach and he rewarded her by stealing the uh Pythian hotel's silverware so uh that's that's the Phipps family of uh, the Smith family story. All right, why don't we go to the next picture now? Uh, these are the Clarks of Cologne, Panama. Uh, Cologne was the staging area for the building of the Panama Canal. Believe it or not, almost to the day Kenneth Clark was born, little Kenneth Clark. Uh, in that city, Cologne, the Panama Canal opened. But that little town of Cologne was a boom town because that was the way probably most of the material to build the Panama Canal came into the country. Uh, because I imagine most of it would come from the east, eastern part of the United States. Uh, some of it probably came from California area, maybe Texas, and that might have uh, come, no, no, not Texas, but California might have come through the uh, Panama City, uh, the Pacific entry into the uh, into uh, Panama, uh, the, the, the Panama Canal. But uh, Cologne was on the uh, Caribbean Sea, and so it became really the staging area. So lots of people who lived in the West Indies, the islands of the Caribbean, uh, people like the, the Clarks of Jamaica migrated there. Many of the workers who built the canal were from Jamaica. Other islands as well, but, but probably the majority of those who were Black came from Jamaica. Uh, Walter Clark, here the, the um, patriarch of the family with bow tie and suit, uh, he uh, was a supervisor on the docks. Uh, that young man, the eldest of the children, in the back of the boot, with the uh, boot near his lapel, that's Arthur and Clark, Kenneth Clark's father. Okay, let's, uh, and again, education, very important, hard work, very important, middle class values, because like the Fitzes, these, these Clarks were middle class, and they wanted their children to aspire and succeed. And they also wanted them to be in solidarity with uh, the black, uh, the black masses. And so they sent their children, uh, at some expense, to Jamaica to further their education on the British island of Jamaica. And that is because Panama was a Spanish-speaking uh, nation, and your education was in Spanish. So okay, why don't we go to the next picture? And here's. Little Kenny Clark at age nine. This is his uh, passport, and he used this to get to Ellis Island. Uh, after having spent a year in Jamaica, uh, his mother uh, adhered to that family, the Clark family tradition of sending the children to Jamaica to learn their roots, learn about their Jamaican heritage, and have a taste of the British education. And Kenneth came back to Harlem, and Harlem schools, by the way, at that time were integrated. Harlem was integrated. Uh, many schools were uh, severe, I mean, were strictly segregated and regarded as inferior. Uh, but Harlem schools were regarded as very good back then, and, uh, and he skipped the grade. He did, he learned so much in uh, Jamaica because they had a pretty rigorous uh, system, education system, he skipped the grade. So, okay, let's try the next picture. This is young Kenneth, a uh, teenager, uh, if not a teenager yet, he's 12, something like that, and a budding sculptor. And uh, this is uh, an exhibition of his uh, sculpt sculpture work, these face masks. Uh, we noticed are, are people from different nations and people of different colors, which I find fascinating because he became a renowned, unyielding integrationist. And, <coughs> pardon me. 
and also also a lifelong lover of art, particularly African American and African art. And he had a lot of good close friends who were uh, among the great artists of the 20th century. And I include Romare Bearden, uh, 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 Jacob Lawrence and his wife, Gwen Knight, and um, uh, Charles Pinky Alston. Now these artists gave him, in many cases, they gave him artworks. He bought others. He had a lot of African sculptures. And uh, at his, uh, after his death, early in, in the 21st century, the collection was valued at more than $4, $4 million. So next picture. This is his mother, his Jamaican born mother, uh, who moved to Panama with her family, married Arthur Tim Clark, broke up with Arthur Tim. Uh, family lore says that uh, uh, he was unfaithful to her. They clashed over her uh, insistence that they moved to America. He said a, a black man can't get a decent job like the one I have as a supervisor on the docks at, in Cologne. You can't get that kind of job as a long charman in New York City. So he refused to go. And, uh, and she went ahead and got a job in the uh, garment district as a seamstress and got an education, uh, finished her high school degree, had a, uh, a diploma at uh, a very good high school in Washington Heights, uh, George Washington High School, and encouraged her children to do the same, get good educations. She put both her children, she had two, girl and a boy, uh, through college. Okay, let's try the next, next one. Here's Kenneth, uh, and this is a picture of the doll test. Uh, it's in a series of photos Famous photos, I must say. Sometimes hanging, you'll see them hanging in museums as I have on three occasions, just by chance, walking to a museum. And there's a Gordon Parks photograph of Kenneth Clark giving the doll test. It was a, a photo shoot he did for Ebony Magazine in 1947. It appeared in the July 47 edition of Ebony. And this is a picture simulating what the doll test is like. This little boy is named for the purposes of the article as Peter, and he has just selected the white doll over the bl a black doll. Notice there aren't four of them, which is the way the test really was, too white and too brown, uh, but this is just after all a simulation. This is the playroom, the little children's room, uh, room for consultations with children, at the Northside Center for Child Development, which Mamie and Kenneth founded. It was a uh, psychiatric center for little children, uh, Northside Center for Child Development, and they helped children who were at risk of uh, juvenile delinquency. Children with, who were troubled, children who had problems that still exist today uh, and continues to serve the, the, the people of Holland. Um, okay, let's try the next picture. Uh, here's Mamie in Hot Springs. Excuse me, her mother is the uh, woman with her hand on her chin behind her on a settee. Um, and Mamie has her little boy here. Uh, this is during World War II. This is 1943. Uh, we know because Hilton was born that year, uh, so it was about 43 or maybe maybe uh, or, or the summer of 44. I'm not, I'm not certain exactly, but this is during World War II, and Mamie is uh, coming close to finishing her PhD in psychology at, uh, at Columbia. Uh, to the left is her daughter, Kate, her firstborn, who was born in 1940. And I should add, a lot of what I'm going to say to you is about Kenneth. He was the more famous, the more outspoken, the more verbal uh, public figure in the family. But Mamie 
in many, many ways. It was the brains of the family. Uh, Mamie was the manager, the administrator. Mamie's research for her master's degree thesis at Howard, where they met, Howard University in Washington, uh, that thesis became the springboard to the famous doll test, which played such a big role in Brown versus Board of Education. Um, okay, let's go to the next picture. Our last, and here are the uh, Clarks, all of them in adulthood. Uh, Kenneth has just retired. Mamie is about to retire soon when this picture was taken. Uh, Kenneth had founded uh, as a retirement job, a uh, executive consulting firm to uh, work on affirmative action and minority hiring cases for companies and government agencies. And, uh, and the whole family worked at it. Uh, each of them had a role in the case of Mamie and her daughter Kate part-time, in the case of Hilton and Kenneth full-time. Okay, so Tim, we're done with the pictures and fire away with some questions that you have for me. Okay, thank you for that, uh, for going through those pictures. That was uh, interesting. So first, uh, I know we're, probably, we're all uh, curious as to how you got interested in, in writing this book. Well, um, <clears throat> as your introduction mentioned, I was a education writer for the uh, Capital City newspaper in Albany. Albany was the capital, the Times Union, and that is the seat of government. That's where the State Board of Regents was, and Kenneth Clark served on the State Board of Regents, which basically operated as the school board for the, for the entire state. But more than that, it also oversaw all of the colleges, all of the universities, all of the private and public schools in the entire state. It, there is no other uh, governing board in any state as powerful as that one. And he was a, the only historic figure on that board. And by chance, he was the first black member of the board. You may have heard of a couple other famous regents in New York. And uh, a guy named Alexander Hamilton, you might have heard of him, and John Jay. And their oil portraits were hanging in the regent's chamber. And then there was this humble little black man, brown shoulder, uh, sat in the room among all these white people. And he was really the only living historic person in that, in that room. So that's how I met him. And, and uh, the first time I met him, I attended a Regents meeting. I interviewed him afterward for a couple of hours. And we talked about the doll test and Brown. And But when I first met him, I said to him, uh, I extended my condolences for the death of Mamie, who at only 66 had died of, of, uh, of uh, lung cancer, which had spread to her brain. And, uh, and he put his hands on his stomach and said, oh, I feel like I've lost an organ, meaning he lost his wife. And uh, so I said, you know, this is a book that's gotta be written. We've gotta have a biography of this man and his wife together, a family story, a historic story, a story of psychology. And that's, that's how I got to do it. Well, uh, how did, uh, you mentioned um, uh, Mamie was at Columbia working on her PhD. Is that where they met at Columbia? No, Howard. Howard, they met at Howard, Howard University. And she did her master's degree that didn't use dolls, but used pictures mm -hmm. and to evoke in children uh, some of their ideas about uh, their racial identity. Uh, Racism wasn't the purpose of that. Um, the idea of racial identity was not the purpose of her thesis. <coughs> Pardon me. The purpose was to discover at what age do children appear to begin to be conscious of themselves as distinct human beings. And she concluded from her work that about three and four years old, children began to think because 
the children were shown a variety of pictures, not just of black children, a black boy and a white boy, but also, believe it or not, a chicken, a dog. And some of those children were really, really young, might actually point to something like a dog. And uh, so this is how she came to conclude. Uh, and she'd have a conversation with him about this consciousness, the consciousness of not only self, but by chance of color. And she noticed again that some of the black children preferred the picture to identify the picture of a white boy as opposed to a black boy. And she wondered why. And that is why she and Kenneth concocted the doll test, put together the doll test. What year did they uh, start uh, doing the doll tests? Uh, they started, well, I'm, they might have had some test flights <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, before, but they actually in earnest began in 1940. And there's an Arkansas story here. They wanted to, just as they did with Mamie's thesis, they wanted to um, question a, a good sized sample of Northern children, all black, and Southern children, all black. So segregated youngsters versus integrated youngsters and see if that would make a difference. And uh, so they started in not too far from where I'm sitting now, Springfield, Massachusetts, a uh, mid-sized city, small, small, fairly small. And, uh, and then they went to hot springs, they went to hot springs and Kenneth conducted the testing in hot springs also. Um, Hot Springs was smaller than Springfield, so he needed more ballots, more, more test takers. So he went to Little Rock and did some, and he went to Pine Bluff and got some more. And, uh, and that's, how that, uh, that's how that story unfolded. That's the Southern Connection. How did they, rec how did they find the children uh, to do the test? Did they go into school? Did they recruit them, or how, how did that Work. They actually, they actually went to the school districts involved, and uh, I have a, a letter Kenneth wrote to uh, the head of. Uh, this was the New Deal, right? This is the '30s, the late '30s, the New Deal. We approached the uh, WPA Works Progress Administration head of nursery nurse uh, nur nursery schools in Springfield. And I have a picture, I have a, uh, I have that letter and, uh, and he's asking the guy who's ahead of that uh, if he could test their children. And also I have uh, documents that show the, the names and birth dates of every child, what school they attended, um, who was their teacher's name, in most cases their teacher's name, their birth date, the whole thing. So it's all done by school. And so he went into the schools. So it, you're, it, it sounds like a pretty simple test. You have four dolls, you ask the child to choose, and there were, there were a series of questions that they asked the children. Uh, is that all that was involved in the experiment or the, or the test? No, there was really quite a bit more. It was an IQ test. Um, I think the reasoning being that if you uh, are testing a child who is developmentally uh, disabled, for instance, or you want to account for the uh, inconsistencies in the answers. I think that was part of it. Also, you might get a pretty clear sense of the development stage of a child who is, let's say, three or two, two and a half. You get a pretty good idea from that, that test. Um, so there was the IQ test. Mamie had put together Kenneth's favorite test, which was a coloring test. She invented a test where each child would uh, color an apple, uh, I think a banana, uh, and a picture of a boy and a picture of a girl. And they would, uh, uh, Kenneth asked, and by the way, Kenneth did all the testing because Mamie began pregnant and uh, and as the testing wound it up, wound up, uh, she was she was nursing her first child, 
and getting a doctorate at the same time, if you can imagine. I guess there was a little bit on her plate. So she was pretty busy. And so he did all this testing. Um, but anyway, um, uh, so there was that coloring test, IQ test, doll test. And there was also the picture test, drawings. Uh, some of the same pictures that Mamie had used for a master's thesis. And uh, you know, again, which is, which is the one that looks like you, the, the, the white boy or the white girl? Because she, she felt that with girls, the test didn't work for her master's thesis uh, because uh, she only had a picture of a boy, uh, a white boy and a white, uh, uh, a black boy and a white boy. So she made sure she had uh, boys and girls of both colors. What was the, um, so could I add one thing, Tim, could I add one thing? Sure, of course. I, on this, there really is a lot involved in this. Uh, when you just hear about doll test, maybe I would say did the lion's share of the work. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenneth did the testing, but you know, once you do the test, it's, it's done for him. Mm -hmm. For her, what she did was she was a, uh, uh, originally a math major. She was pretty good with figures. And uh, so she did all the statistical work and her, her uh, doctoral thesis had to do with uh, psych psychological measurements, testing. And uh, so she used complex math formulas to figure out whether the results were statistically significant or not, or just random and so on. And she had these elaborate tables. So this in psychology is called tabulating the results, your findings. She did all of that in her immaculate handwriting, page after page after page, breaking down the data by sex, by age, by uh, region of the country, south or north, on and on and on. So maybe, and then, and then she outlined and uh, wrote a draft of a report for the Rosenwald Fund, uh, meaning for the, uh, the Sears tycoon who helped build black schools all through the South um, in Little Rock, Dunbar, had been a, a originally a, a uh, Rosenwald school. And uh, uh, so she wanted, she, they were paid by Rosenwald to do this. So she put all that data on time. But Kenneth was not an administrator, he was not a manager. He was a, uh, uh, an inveterate uh, procrastinator. She was not, and she got it all out. She did all that hard work. Hmm. Well, um, so after the report was the report was issued, what was the reaction uh, to the report? Well, it was not because they didn't publish. Hmm. Uh, it was a time in her life where uh, it was not ideal to try to write something like that and publish it because uh, neither one had a job. That's why they got the grant to help raise their family. And neither had a job and they both scrambled to find jobs. Harder for Mamie because she was a black professional woman with a PhD. Uh, but Kent had a double of a time too. And they both encountered some nasty prejudice uh, in their jobs, in their first jobs, very unhappy experiences. And, but it took years for them to get on, uh, to, get, to get their sea legs. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, they had friends that were appalled by their test results, white friends, scholars, mentors, who said, you've got to publish. And, you know, they were so upset by their findings, the Clarks, and they were not, they were not eager to publish them. They were, uh, Kenneth felt, guilty for subjecting these children to stress because some of them cry uh, and and clearly a, a, a lot of them felt anguished by choosing between dolls and having to admit that uh, the dolls that they've been rejecting were the very ones that look most like them so Kenneth felt anguished he felt torn about it uh, and but I think, and this is my theory, I think I'm right about this, 
to uh, promote Northside Center, which opened in 46, he started uh, reaching out to newspapers, magazines, radio stations to do stories about uh, Northside Center. And as a way to promote that, he talked about this interesting test that he and his wife had done. And that Ebony Magazine article came out in 47. And there was a lot of pictures that had quite an impact. And what it did was it helped get them uh, the support of Marion Askeley, Rosenwald's daughter, who bailed the parts out. They were going bankrupt running that Northside Center. She bailed them out and helped transform that center uh, into a uh, professional operation that was a paid staff instead of a volunteer staff. So that, that's that. How did, um, so how, what role did the report and the article in Ebony, uh, what role did those, those two uh, uh, reports and articles play into the Brown versus uh, Board of Education in 54? Sure. Well, the NAACP had begun fighting segregation in colleges and universities, uh, particularly in graduate schools. They were smart. They started with law schools and, and they won in the Supreme Court because justices and judges are all of them lawyers. And uh, so the NAACP was pretty smart. And they said, you know, they're going to they're gonna probably rule in our favor with law schools. But then they went on to professional schools like schools of education. And then last, they knew this was going to be the toughest nut to crack. Public schools, K through 12. They knew this was going to be tough. And they needed evidence. The very famous case, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, ruled, the, the, the Supreme Court ruled that if, if black people did not like, uh, resented separation of public accommodations like schools, hospitals, hotels, and so on, and felt it was discriminatory, then it was all, basically they said, it's all in their heads. It's just a notion basically in their minds. And what the NAACP wanted to prove was that there were a show that there was psychological and, and uh, other social science evidence that black people and other minorities were paying a price for discrimination in public accommodations, like schools. <coughs> and uh, the NAACP went to uh, a white psychologist uh, at uh, Columbia, and he said, you know, we've got this guy, Kenneth Clark, and Kenneth did a study for the White House, 1950, on uh, children and prejudice, and uh, you've got to take a look at that, that report, because it's pretty interesting. He pulls together all the social science experiments and literature on the subject of prejudice and ethnicity and shows the damage done to these various ethnic groups. Now they included Hispanics, they included Native Americans, uh, even uh, Inuit peoples from the uh, North, uh, indigenous people of the great Northwest, uh, Italian Americans, and of course, Jewish. Uh, people, many Jewish psychologists had written about an inferiority complex among Jews. And so Kenneth and Mamie were both scholars who were very, very familiar with the theory of, the theories of, um, oh my gosh, I, I seem to, uh, I, I'm blanking on this name now, Austrian psychologist, a colleague of Simon Freud's. In any case, he was the father of the theory of the inferiority complex. And this is what the Clarks are testing with the doll test. 
do black people, because of segregation and discrimination in America, do they feel inferior? Whites have, uh, white supremacists have clearly tried to make them feel that way. Do they feel that way? And so Thurgood Marshall, uh, one of his attorneys got Kenneth's report to the White House Conference on Children in 1950. And he said, Kenneth, this couldn't have been better if it was written for us. Because Kenneth is saying that school segregation is, is arguing that segregation is harmful to the self-esteem, the self-identity of Black people, not just children but black people will encounter day after day after day, ridicule and abuse of various kinds. And so Kent used the doll test in courtrooms, his doll test results. He went to, um, now doll test involves people from four states and the District of Columbia. So Kenneth starts in South Carolina, that's the first trial. And he tests children in the Scotts Branch School in Somerton, South Carolina, and finds pretty much the identical results. And he testifies in court, federal court. Um, and uh, the, I mean, it's segregated courtroom, right? And uh, it, it's in, the, in Charleston, it's the heart of segregation, let me put it that way. And of course they lose, but then, uh, and sometimes they won and sometimes they lost in these cases, but they appealed all of them to the Supreme Court because only the Supreme Court could overrule Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, which said, hey, if black people have a problem with this, it's a problem in their own minds. Well, how is, um, are they, are the Clarks, are they only known for the doll test or are they known for the, I, you mentioned the Child Study Center uh, in Harlem. So they're known for, for the, the, that facility and the doll test. Are they known for other things as well? Did they do? Yes, I, I think I mentioned that Kenneth was the most famous black scholar in America, much like uh, Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. is today. I mean, you watch Finding Your Roots on PBS, there he is. Kenneth Clark was on television all the time. He was on radio all the time. The New York Times put him on the front page so often, it's almost like he ran in space there. He was there all the time. Other newspapers across the country, uh, he'd be reading articles in some little newspaper in Idaho. And there's Kenneth Clark who was giving a speech there. And um, he was dogged in pursuing uh, journalists to, to pay attention to his ideas. He was a, an evangelist for integration. <coughs> Pardon me. So these people are really well known. Um, <coughs> Mamie served on the board of all these extremely powerful governing boards in New York City. Uh, where she was known for, for running Northside Center. And so she was on the governing board of ABC News, uh, not News, ABC Broadcast Corporation. Oh, wow. And, and uh, MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, and uh, the New York Public Library, and many other, and many other. And she was nominated many times, so many times she had to turn them down. Uh, so Mamie was uh, really well known. I mean, she was chosen after all by, uh, through uh, 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 Sergeant Shriver to uh, serve on this board of just 12 people to set up the guidelines for Head Start. Uh, there are three movies about, in part, the doll test and the parts and Brown versus Board of Education, three. One of them is Thurgood, uh, which was originally a Broadway play. Then it went to HBO as a movie. Uh, then there's um, um, Separate But Equal, uh, a major television movie, and uh, uh, Sim Simple Justice, also a television 
made for television movie. So, you know, it's a long time since that time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've forgotten who these people were. And I just felt, you know, they need a biography so we remember who they were. But they were really well known in their day. Yeah, I mean, they were very accomplished uh, uh, people and uh, so intelligent. Uh, yes. Uh, well, are, is the doll test still conducted today? All over the world. Really, all over the world. Uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll just Google doll test and I'll find another, another doll test I didn't know about. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was Googling and I found one from Italy. Um, and it was, you know, it was given to a uh, black children, um, but very often it's given now to white children to get a sense of their prejudices. And some of these kids' comments would curl your hair. I mean, it's very discouraging, actually. Um, CNN did a whole week-long series on the doll test every night for five nights. And uh, we did, I think, in 2012, after Obama's elected, you know, they wanted to see with a black president, how would this affect doll test results? Well, the results hadn't changed all that much. Mm -hmm. uh, and the white children, some of their parents teared up, cried, because they were embarrassed that their children would make uh, pejorative remarks about the brown doll. Uh, they didn't use dolls on CNN, they used pictures. Uh, the same picture with a uh, like cartoon figure uh, with five different shades of black or white or we wanna call, whatever you want to call that. But then they re-ran that, they re -ran that study um, in, with interviews again in, 19, in 2014. So uh, it's gotten a lot of attention. It's been done in South Africa. It's been done in um, Trinidad and Tobago. It's been done in um, uh, Australia and New Zealand. And those are some of those that I know about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all over this country, uh, there are two boxes with the documents from the doll test, doll test, I call them doll test sheets. Mm -hmm. And they're in two boxes at the Library of Congress. These are two of the most popularly selected boxes in the Library of Congress. Wow. Hmm. That's, how, that's how interesting people find this hmm. and how many people consult those before they do their own testing. Well, um, you know, your biography of, of the Clarks, the doctors, uh, Dr. Uh, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, I mean, it's just... Thank you for for uh, you know bringing them to the forefront and and their uh, accomplishments and their research because I I would uh, I would assume that there would be a lot of people the average person had never even heard of the Clarks and the Dalt test. That's that's true, but you know it's always interesting because whenever I give a talk, people are. Uh, Full of questions. I've, I've never once given this talk and I've given it a couple dozen times. <clears throat> I've never had a quiet room after, <clears throat> after I finished uh, my remarks. There's always lots of questions. Well, I would imagine that it, 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 it uh, generates a lot of soul searching and sort of the inherent bias that we all have. Yes. Yeah, it does. And, and when I do this, I usually talk about the state of the schools back then, segregated schools, and people are astounded. White, always white people, not, not so much black people. White people are astounded. I say, you know, the average black school in America back then uh, had no uh, running water in the school. It had uh, outdoor toilets. It had a bucket of water with a dipper. No water fountains. White kids have got the water fountains and they got the plush toilets, but the black kids didn't. Uh, the roofs were leaking, hot delete stoves, no central, no central heating systems, certainly no air conditioning. Um, uh, I mean, it's a real sad, shameful chapter of American history. What we did to the education 
for black people. No school buses. White kids have all of those things. But the local school boards did not want to pay. Uh, in uh, Somerton, South Carolina, the parents, you know, they would build the school. They would supply the land. The school board wouldn't do it. it all over the country, this was the case. Black parents had to buy the land. They had to build the school with their own sweat. They had to get Rose and Moral money or some other kind of uh, tax or church tithe to erect the school. Uh, and I mean, it's really, really sad. And the teachers uh, were paid very typically in Hot Springs. Uh, no, I shouldn't say Hot Springs, but very typically paid roughly half what white teachers earn. And in many cases, better educated because some states in the like 1950s are uh, to avoid integration, passed laws giving tuition money to black students to go out of state if there wasn't a black college or university that had a program in the field they wanted to study in. So very often those black students end up at Columbia, uh, University of Chicago, really incredibly elite schools. Well, thank you so much for being here and for uh, uh, enlightening us on, on the Clarks and, um, and, the Dal and the Dalt test. Your book is still available, is that correct? Yes, and uh, paperback will be out in probably February. Well, definitely February. Uh, but yes, it, it's still pretty easy to get a hold. Great, great. Well, thank, thank you. So you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here and thank you all uh, in the audience for being here and we'll look forward to uh, seeing you next month. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Bye now. Bye.